And Father, we are recording, so if you'd be willing to start us off, that would be great. Absolutely. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Almighty God, we thank you that you have poured out your Spirit upon us so that we could be united with your heart. We ask, Lord, that you prepare the hearts of each of those students who are being confirmed this year, that they may uh, be able to receive the fullness of your Holy Spirit, all the gifts and power and fruit of the Holy Spirit, that they may be transformed, that they may become uh, the best version of themselves, Lord. We ask, Lord, that you bless these parents and people who are helping them to, to grow in what that means to be uh, a confirmed Catholic. Lord, give them the wisdom, the discernment, uh, the courage, the love that they need in order to walk with uh, their children on this path. Bless all the sponsors who will be helping in this process as well, Lord. We ask that you uh, touch Adam today, that um, his words may speak your words, your words about the Spirit, and that our hearts may be open to your grace. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So Adam had just asked that I just start off uh, today just with uh, a word of hope. And especially in the midst of uh, spiking COVID, especially here in New Hampshire, and I, somebody just told me yesterday that uh, we can no longer go into Massachusetts, you know, without quarantining or a test. And I was like, oh dear, I knew that I, I, I knew that I couldn't go to my Thanksgiving because I can't go into Vermont. And now to hear that, it's like, oh, it's just over the border now. Um, and, and with all of this going on, we can get discouraged. We can lose sight on of. Uh, what's important, we can say, God, where are you? But the truth is, God's in charge. God is a day ahead of us. He, he has our backs. He, he loves us so much. And he's bigger than COVID. Uh, this weekend, I'm planning on talking in my homily about just how Christ as king of the universe, because this is the feast of Christ the king, how Christ is king of the universe, he, he's bigger than all this, and that we need to, instead of uh, getting discouraged or dis despairing, rather, look to him and look to his love. It, it is so easy to get discouraged, but remember, remember, Jesus went into the very depths of death like a Trojan horse so that from the inside out, he could overcome it. He could conquer death. He could conquer sin. He could conquer brokenness. He could conquer sickness. And he has a plan for your life, for your children's lives. When he created you, when he had the idea of you in his mind, he knew you would be here in 2020 in the midst of this chaotic time. And he has a plan for your life. Trust that love. Trust his love for you. And turn to him in the deepest discouragements and trials and struggles that you have. And turn yourself over to him and his love. He wants to help you. In the immortal words of the prophet Forrest Gump, that's all I got to say about that. All right. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Father, um, for those words. You know, Jesus is our hope. He is our anchor. And he is so, so good. He is such a good father to us all. So before we get started, I would encourage you, you know, all to switch your screens to speaker view. And if you are not muted, um, please mute your audio. So that way the speaker view doesn't, you know, change throughout our time together. Can everyone hear me okay? All right, awesome, awesome. So I just want yes. to... Make sure everybody is. All 
Okay. So today, obviously, we're talking about the sacrament of confirmation. And this is such an important sacrament. And it is a sacrament that I feel many, many times, you know, we take for granted, similar to our sacrament of reconciliation. You know, it, it's kind of like the gift that we are given by Almighty God, and we forget to fully unwrap it. So today, I want to do some unwrapping, you know, because we have all been confirmed. We all have these sacramental graces in our lives within us right now. And so as we prepare our children, it is an amazing reminder of that truth. You know, that it's, it, this isn't just about preparing our kids. This is reminding ourselves of God's power that is within us today. You know, that this isn't just um, something that we receive, that we prepare to receive, that we receive, and it's like, woohoo, that's done. This is something that grows and the graces continue outpouring in our lives forever for the rest of our life here on earth. So this is good news. This is good news for us because it's still working in our lives today. So, uh, oh yeah, my button's over here. All right, so I share my screen. So the sacrament of confirmation, if I had to do this teaching in one slide, this would be it. The sacrament of confirmation calls us to be a fire blazing. One of my most favorite verses in scripture is in the gospels. And Jesus himself says, I have come to set the world on fire and I wish that it were already burning. Now he's not talking about physically, literally setting things on fire. He's talking about our soul, setting our soul on fire, the spirit within us, okay? And, and so he wants to see a people that are, that are zealous and on fire for the Lord, truly in love with the Lord. And this is what confirmation does for us. It gives us this zeal for the faith, this fire for the faith, because two of the greatest, you know, things that confirmation give to us, and we'll talk about this later, but one is a strengthening of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which we were given on the day of our baptism, right? Those gifts are within us, and confirmation stirs them up and strengthens them. And the other is this very unique to confirmation, this unique call to mission, this unique call to mission right? As part of the body of Christ in the world. So first we start out and we kind of, we talk about, okay, what is confirmation? We just got that started already. So in the sacrament of confirmation, just as we see the Holy Spirit pouring itself out upon Jesus on the day of his baptism, he calls us to that same fullness of spirit. Now we talk about this a lot. Jesus in no way needed to be baptized. He, he is God. He was without sin. He was not in need of baptism, but he did it to show us the way. He did it to show us and point to this and say, this is the start of everything. Baptism is the beginning. And so baptism, we're going to find this out today, baptism is very intimately connected with the sacrament of confirmation. Because as I already said, in the sacrament of confirmation, the gifts that we receive at baptism are strengthened so that we are prepared to go out and live a life of mission for the Lord. So really confirmation is a starting point. Confirmation is a beginning. Confirmation is nowhere near the end of our spiritual journey. Okay, so what is confirmation? We go back 
in the book of Acts, right at the beginning of Acts, we, we hear about the story of Pentecost. And that's what this image with is. Mary and the apostles and all the other disciples are in the upper room. You know, at this point, Jesus has spent his, he has risen from the grave. He spent his time on earth and then he has ascended back to the father. And so they're in the upper room and they're afraid and they don't know what to do next. And so they're in the upper room, they're praying. They're praying to God and they're saying, Lord, you know, lead the way, lead the way. What do we do next? And then in the book of Acts, it's described that the Holy Spirit fills the room, busts open the windows, the locked windows, like a strong driving wind and rests, tongues as a fire, rest upon all of the apostles and the disciples in the room. And they're filled with this courage that they just can't understand. They can't explain. And, and all of a sudden they have this love and this zeal. They're like, we know the truth. We've seen the truth. His name is Jesus. Now we need to go tell people about the truth and how amazing it is. And how amazing it is. So St. Peter, there's a reason he was the first poop, Pope. Um, St. Peter busts open the door of the upper room and he starts to tell everyone in the marketplace about Jesus and what Peter has seen with his own eyes and heard with his own ears. And that day, 3,000 people are baptized because of his boldness. 3,000 people are born into the life of Christ, which is the key for heaven brothers and sisters. You know, that baptism is that entry point into the body of Christ. And that is where we begin to draw closer and closer to our heavenly home. So Pentecost is our own personal Pentecost, where we can walk out of the church having that boldness, having that zeal for the faith, being set on fire, as Christ says in the Gospels, for the faith so that we can go out and share that with others. The sacrament of confirmation, as I've said before, strengthens our life of faith by the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So these are, these are gifts. We have to remember that the Holy Spirit, the sacrifice of Christ, everything is total gift to us out of his divine love. His love for us is so deep. It is so dear that he says, you know what? I am going to give them everything they need for the journey. I am going to prepare them and give them the graces that they need to gain heaven, to get to heaven. So, uh, you know, our, our heaven, you know, us getting to heaven, our goodness, our virtue, everything, you know, that we're able to do that is good and righteous and holy in this world, it is gift. It is by his grace. And so we are thankful for that. We, we're moving into the Thanksgiving week. Let's be grateful for his grace in our lives. Because it is through his grace that we are able to accomplish anything at all. He gives us, he pours these graces out and allows us amazingly to be his voice in the world. His hands, his feet. And this is what the sacrament of confirmation is. It's what it calls us to do. So the sacrament of confirmation, this is really important. It confers upon us an indelible spiritual mark. So again, we see this intimate link between baptism and confirmation because baptism, that, Baptism confers an indelible spiritual mark upon us. And likewise, <laughs> that's my Joseph. Um, likewise, confirmation does the same thing. What does this mean? This means that we only receive baptism and confirmation once in our lives because it places upon us that indelible, that permanent spiritual mark that cannot be erased. 
you know, so, so we can't be confirmed one day and say yes to the sacrament. And then the next day be like, Oh, I don't think that ever happened. No, it's there. We, we can't rub it away. We can't erase it. We can't shake it off. It is permanently with us for the rest of our lives. And sometimes what happens is if, you know, if we, if we struggle or we fall out of faith, those, those, those spiritual gifts, those graces that are poured out in the sacrament, they can grow dormant. They can, for lack of a better term, they can fall asleep within us, but they are still there. They do still remain. And the last piece that's really important when we're talking about the sacrament of confirmation is the ordinary minister of the sacrament is the bishop. Now, now, of course, many of you know, in the spring, you know, Father Vaughn gave the sacrament of confirmation to quite a large group of our, our, our students simply because of what happened with COVID. And there is, there is a clause, there is in, like in an emergency scenario, the bishop can give his priest permission to give the sacrament of confirmation, but it's out of the ordinary. It's, it's not an ordinary thing for that to happen. Normally and ordinarily, it will be the bishop conferring the sacrament. And what that does is, you know, the bishop is the sign of the universal church. And so him coming to confer the sacrament of confirmation upon us really gives us that bigger vision picture. You know, we are, we are not just a part of St. Patrick Parish in Pelham, New Hampshire. The Catholic Church is worldwide. It is, Catholic means universal. We are part of this universal body of Christ. And these sacraments, the graces of these sacraments unite us to all Catholics throughout the entire world. That is why it's so important our priests follow the liturgy and the prayers that are written to a precise T, you know, to a T, because we can go all around the world and we will hear the same prayers at every single Holy Mass. We are universal church, and that is beautiful, and that is powerful, because in the Eucharist, we are all united. That is how we stay connected as the body of Christ. It grows that unity between all the members of the body of Christ. And so that's why frequenting and going to the Eucharist at least every Sunday is so important. It's not just about us. It's not just for, you know, the growth of our personal um, spiritual life and our souls, but it keeps us united with the body of Christ. And now on the flip side, we have to talk about what confirmation is not, okay? Because there's a lot of confusion about confirmation. And because of that confusion, when, when our bishop brought the age back to third grade, these confusions kind of just messed with people's heads and say, why, why are we doing this? I thought confirmation was this. I thought confirmation was that. When the reality is it's not. Okay, so what confirmation is not, it is not a coming of age celebration like a Jewish bar mitzvah. Okay, some people will equate the two things and they are in no way alike or in common. Okay, the bar mitzvah in its essence is a coming of age celebration. Confirmation is not. Confirmation is not. Okay, confirmation is does not mark the end of formal religious education. Okay, believe me, if I stopped learning about my faith when I was confirmed, I would not be where I was today. I would not have the faith that I did today. You know, so, so the growth in our faith, the growth drawing closer to Jesus, it's lifelong. You, you know, so... So, you know, we, we teach our kids in school or at home, home, it's so important to be lifelong learners, right? And to always have an active mind and to always be learning. Confirmation is, 
is the same. You know, it, there's, it's not, we don't stop. We don't stop with our faith. We don't stop growing closer to Jesus. There's always a deeper place to learn, a deeper place to grow when it comes to our faith and when it comes to the Lord, okay? Confirmation is not a rite of passage, okay? It, it's, it, you know, like, just like, just like the, the mark before, it's, 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 it doesn't mark an end. It doesn't, it's not a rite of passage. It's not saying that that individual is now an adult in the church. Don't use that language. Never use that language because that is as far from the truth of this sacrament as possible. Okay. So it's not the mark of an end. It's not an ending. It's not a rite of passage. Okay. And in, um, you know, when, when the church is talking about the sacrament, um, the language they'll use is they'll use the language, the age of reason, the sacrament of confirmation, you know, it, it, it's called, it's to be disposed at the age of reason. And, you know, look, looking at science, looking at, you know, child development, looking at all of that, the age of reason is right around seven years old. Um, and, and so that's why, you know, that's why it, the bishop decided and discerned and prayed for 13, 14 years, you know, this process to before this decision was made, that's how long it was prayed and discerned about. Um, that's why we brought confirmation back to third grade. That's the big why, because that age of reason. And another important thing when it comes to confirmation is we, we, we want to look at proper disposition, um, which is an openness to receiving the graces of the sacrament, right? That, that is another important element when we're preparing our children for confirmation. And so what I found as we were moving through this change is our children, when they're in third grade, they are much more open to receiving the graces of the sacrament. And once those graces take root in our lives, they begin to transform us and they begin to change everything in our lives. So that proper disposition at the time of receiving the sacrament is so, so important. Okay, and the last point, confirmation is not even a ratification of a personal faith choice. And so it's not like, it's not our children, okay, you're older now. So now you can make the, the choice to follow this, the Catholic faith on your own. That's not what it is. So when we talk about confirmation, we need to stop talking about it's something that you decide. It's something that you do. It's about you. Confirmation is not about us. It's not about us at all. Confirmation is all about what God is doing in the sacrament, how he is moving, how he's transforming hearts and minds so that we can be the best version of ourselves and so that we can work towards heaven, right? So that we can move closer and closer to our heavenly home. This is what confirmation is all about. It's not about us. It's about what God has to do in us and wants to do in us. All we need to do over here is say, yes, I'm open to what you want to do. I'm open to the graces that you want to pour out into my life. So it's yes. Our role in confirmation is yes to God. <laughs> and once we say yes, Hold on tight, because it's going to be like Pentecost in the upper room, right? There's going to be wind and fire and whoo, it's going to be an exciting time. So once we say yes, we need to get excited and we need to get ready. And this is such an exciting time as your children are preparing for the sacrament of confirmation. And some of them are also preparing for the sacrament of first Holy Communion. Boom. Talk about an outpouring of grace in one day. 
there's going to be fireworks, spiritual fireworks that day. So I'm so thrilled and so excited that you said yes and that your children are saying yes to receiving these amazing graces in their lives. All right. So when we, when we talk about baptism, when we talk about confirmation, we talk a lot about the Holy Spirit. And a lot of people say, well, uh, what is the Holy Spirit? <clears throat> Who is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is a person, right? Amen, amen. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And what is so beautiful about the Holy Spirit, all right, is the Holy Spirit is the love between the Father and the Son. So is there is this perfect union between the Father and the Son. There is such a beautiful union and such a perfect love that they are one in the same, right? There is this beautiful union between the Father and Son. So there's God the Father, God the Son. And through this perfect union, through this perfect love, the Holy Spirit is unleashed and birthed into our lives, into the world, into the Catholic Church. Because Christ, in with his very breath, in his own words, when he was on earth, before he ascended back to the Father, he promised that the Holy Spirit would remain with and in the church until the end of time. So is the church perfect? No, because there's people. And last time I checked, nobody's perfect, right? There's people in the church. And so there's brokenness and there's sin, but the truth remains in the church because Jesus makes a promise and Jesus always always follows through with his promises. The Holy Spirit will remain with the church until the end of time. That's why I don't know about you guys. I'm sticking around and I'm not going anywhere. I love the church. I love its long history, right? It's rich and beautiful tradition. So let's dig into that. And let's learn about that as in, with our family. The Holy Spirit is an advocate, right? The Holy Spirit is a great helper in all times, all right? In our times of need, in our times of joy, in our times of sadness, in our times of struggle, the Holy Spirit is advocate. And so I challenge you as a family, you know, as your children are preparing to receive this great sacrament, Start to pray to the Holy Spirit more. Because, you know, in, in our prayers, you know, we talk to Jesus, we talk to God, you know, we, we call out to those persons of the Trinity quite often. But how often do we call upon the Holy Spirit? And it simply starts like this. Start your prayer like this. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Holy Spirit. Just ask him to, to come, to be present, to be with you, to be with your family. Come Holy Spirit. And I already touched upon that third point. The Holy Spirit is God's presence in the Catholic Church today. He remains with us. He always will remain with us. He is so good that he has promised to remain with us. Right? And, and we see our bishops, you know, our, our Holy Father, Pope Francis, our bishops, our priests, the Holy Spirit moves through them in a very special way in their vocation. Right? And, and it is through the graces of the Holy Spirit that they are able to confer the sacraments, that they are able to bring the sacraments to us. Just like we were talking about this sacrament, like, it is through no power of their own that they bring the Eucharist to us, that they bring the sacrament of healing, you know, in reconciliation to us. It is through no power of their own 
It is all about, and this goes for us too, as, as, you know, as lay people, it is all about giving over control to the power of the Holy Spirit. Because the more we give over control to the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, the more we will become the best version of ourselves. And the better we will be able to share God's message and fulfill God's vocation for our lives. Because we all have a vocation, not a vacation. We're not going on one of those anytime too soon. Staycation, right? But a vocation, the vocare, the call, the breath of God, the call of God upon our lives. Each and every one of us has a unique vocation that God has prepared and planned for us. You know, so, so as parents, it's very simple. We're not going to we're not going to push our children towards one vocation or another, but are we talking about all of the vocations? You know, are we talking about, are we talking about marriage and the fact that marriage is a sacrament? Christ came to earth and he elevated the sacrament, the, he elevated marriage to the to sacramental status in the church among six other sacraments. Wow. You know, are we talking about how beautiful and how powerful and how the sacrament of marriage reveals this love between father and son to the world? This is amazing, you guys. This is amazing because just because because just how you know the father, the God, God the Father, and God the Son, their love is perfect, their love is whole, and they birth the Holy Spirit into the world. We reflect that in our marriages, the love between husband and wife, right? Brings amazing and incredible children into the world. What? And God asks us to be, you know, he asks us to take part in his creating. He asks us to be co-creator with him. This vocation is so important. And we need to realize that. Are we talking to our children about the sacrament of holy orders, the sacrament, right, of, of religious life? Man, hang out with priests, hang out with religious, expose your children to them, you know, and, and even if it's through, you know, maybe videos they make or, you know, take a, take a, a tour of, of the, the house the sisters live in. I don't know, the, the you know, orders are getting very creative, especially in this time. Even our own diocese, they've been having, uh, you know, virtual virtual um, get-togethers for young men and for young women just to be exposed to priests and sisters and and hear about what that life is like. It's not like they're signing on the, the dotted line, but if they don't know what it's like, then how will they know if they're called to it and if they are called to choose it or not? So it's really our responsibility to expose them to that way of life because it is a beautiful, beautiful way of life. You know, the call to priesthood, the call to be a brother or a, a sister in a, in a religious order, a beautiful, beautiful call to life. So that is who the Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit moves and animates us in such an important way. And, and like I said before, it is through the graces of the Holy Spirit that we are able to accomplish anything. It is through his grace and through his power, which flows through us. That brings us to, li- uh, to life. You know, St. Saint, Saint Irenaeus 
said, the glory of God is man fully alive. God desires us to be fully alive and to be happy. This is why he gives us all these gifts. This is why he gives us all of these tools to grow in holiness. Because at the end of the day, we need to tell our kids, God longs for your joy. He wants you to be full of joy. He wants you to be happy. Well, all right. This is good news. Oh, here we go. All right. So the next thing we're going to do is I found this, this wonderful video. It's only like four minutes long, very, very short. But what, what I do want to do, um, and it's going through the rite of confirmation, because if we don't understand what's actually going to happen on the day of confirmation, then how can we talk to our kids about it? And the rite of confirmation is so short that we can watch something and it can happen and we can be like, what just happened? <laughs> that did not take any time at all. And so what this video does is it walks through the rite of confirmation. And what I will do is I will stop it. I'll stop the video at certain points because I feel that there are some areas where they go a little too fast. Like there are some signs and symbols that they show in this video that we need to talk just a little bit about to gain an understanding. Okay, so let me get this. Rolling. All right, and actually, I want to make sure. I want to make sure you got, let me just, I want to make sure you guys can hear. Did you guys hear that intro to the video? There was like some music going on. Okay. So here we go. Share sound. I just want to make sure I do this right. So it's actually fruitful for all of us. All right, here we go. Now. There we go. The Sacrament of Confirmation is the Sacrament of Initiation that completes the Sacrament of Baptism, the first Sacrament of Initiation. As Catholic Christians, our initiation is complete when we make our first Holy Communion, becoming full members of the Church. The Sacrament of Confirmation is usually led by the Bishop. The Bishop and Parish Priest welcome all to the celebration of the Sacrament of Confirmation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Peace be with you. The words that I have just spoken are not my words. They are the words of the risen Christ. When he rises from the dead, the first words he speaks are, peace be with you. He's here in our midst and it's he who confirms our young brothers and sisters, breathing into them in a new and deeper way the life of God first breathed into them when they were baptised. Through the Word of God, we're reminded that Jesus is present amongst us and is calling us to be disciples within our community. Within the Gospel, Jesus speaks of the coming of the Holy Spirit. The Bishop expands on this within his homily. A member of the sacramental team calls the candidates by name, reminding us that God calls us by name during our baptism. In the homily, the Bishop speaks to the candidates. Now, because you belong to Jesus, he wants to give you stuff, as you would say. We call them the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Candidates, have you ever heard of the gifts of the Holy Spirit? We call them gifts because they cost you nothing. And they're the gifts that Jesus gives you tonight because you belong to Him. Now here tonight, I'm gonna to make you a promise. 
in His name. If you accept the gifts, don't just throw them away. And if you open the gifts, don't just leave them wrapped up in the corner. And if you then take them out and use the gifts through your life, you will, whatever your life brings, good times and bad times, through all of that, you will experience the peace that only Jesus can give. At baptism, our parents... All right. So, so they whip through that, that first part, but they want to get to the right. And so you'll notice that the, sac the rite of confirmation will happen during Mass. And so, we, and so we saw they walked through the beginning of Mass. They, they went through the liturgy of the Word. And the, the, the Scripture readings will be you know, um, geared towards the sacraments being received, you know, so, so they are, they are special readings, um, specifically for the rites of confirmation and first Holy communion. And, and then before, uh, right after the gospel, before the homily is given, um, I will, I go up and I basically, I stand up all the candidates and I present them to the bishop. It's the just simply called the presentation of the candidates. And then the bishop will have the candidates sit down and then he will direct his homily specifically at them, which is very, very special. You know, so he came, he came there for them. He's going to be talking directly to them. Uh, sometimes he does address the parents and he, and, and sponsors and, and things like that. But um so really, really important. So that's, that's where we're at so far in, in this video. Parents and godparents make our baptismal promises for us. At confirmation, the candidates are asked to renew these promises themselves. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who came upon the apostles at Pentecost and this evening is given to you sacramentally in confirmation? The bishop prays the prayer of confirmation with his hands extended over the candidates. All right, so this is really important. Believe it or not, the rite is just about half over. That's how fast it is. So, so the, the first thing the bishop will do with the candidates is a renewal of their baptismal promises. And we as a church, we do this... Um, at the Easter vigil every year as well. And so these are those words, those prayers you heard are probably familiar to you, but as a church, we renew our baptismal vows every year when we come upon Easter, <coughs> excuse me. But the candidates will do this same thing in the rite of confirmation, because again, it intimately connects the, our baptism with the sacrament of confirmation. So that's really, really important. And what the bishop is doing now is also very important. This, this gesture of laying hands is what he's doing, is, is what the church calls it. This is a very, very powerful gesture. And he's going to be, the bishop will be praying a special prayer that's included in the rite, calling down the Holy Spirit upon the candidates. This gesture of laying on of hands is a gesture that the bishop or priest uses when they are in a very specific way calling down the Holy Spirit upon someone or something, okay? Pay attention when you are at Mass because Father Vaughn will do this same gesture when he is consecrating the bread and wine and transubstantiating it into the body and blood of Jesus. Okay, so really important gesture. All powerful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, by water and the Holy Spirit, you freed these, your sons and daughters from sin and gave them new life. Send your Holy Spirit upon them now to be their helper and guide. Candidates with their sponsors come forward to the bishop. The bishop anoints the candidate with chrism, saying, Be sealed with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The bishop touches the side of the candidate's face and says, Peace be with you.
the candidate responds with, and with your spirit. Prayers of the faithful are offered for those who have been confirmed and for people. Okay. So, so then the second half of the right is, is what you just saw. So the candidates come forward with their sponsors, and I will talk about sponsors and choosing a saint name in just a minute once we're finished with this video. But parents and, I mean, candidates and sponsors will come forward, and the sponsor will have their right hand on the candidate's right shoulder as a sign to the candidate saying, I've got your back for life, okay? And they'll come forward. The sponsor does not say anything. The candidate will come forward to the bishop and say, Bishop, my name is. And at that moment, they will present themselves by their new name that they have chosen. Because one of the things that, that you want to prey on with your children and start doing some research is they will be choosing a patron saint whose name they will take on and it will become a part of their name. So example, my confirmation saint is Francis, St. Francis of Assisi. And so it's not legally changed, but you plug it into your name after the middle name. So my name is now Adam David Francis Castor. Okay, and, and that's very important because uh, I'll, talk about, I'll talk about it a little more later, but what I found is this, this saint really helps to form our faith. We learn from this saint, you know, if we are open to it, and it truly transforms who we are. So it, it is an important decision um, for our children to make. All right, so now we're at the prayers of the faithful everywhere the bishop offers a final blessing and we leave in peace So, so the only thing that, that would be different is we wouldn't just leave in peace. We would keep going and we would go into the liturgy of the Eucharist and we would have a, a full mass at that point. Uh, if, if you were just to celebrate the sacrament of confirmation without having holy mass, that's how it would go. Um, Come on. Um, okay. Now, just like I said, and we were walking through the video, there are a couple important decisions that you, with your children, talking with your children, praying about it with your children, will want to make as they prepare for the sacrament of confirmation. And the first, as I said during the video, is choosing a patron saint. We are blessed to have this massive communion of saints that are in heaven praying constantly for us. So the question comes up sometimes, you know, why all these saints? Why all these saints? You know, some other Christian denominations will even say, why do you pray to these saints? And the answer, the short answer is we do not. We don't pray to saints. How we want to think of the saints, okay? What we believe as church is we have church triumphant, which is the church in heaven, which is in heaven worshiping God and praying for us. We have the church, the church, um, 
suffering, our, our purgative, you know, those individuals who are in purgatory preparing for heaven on their way to heaven. Purgatory is a gift, a huge gift. <laughs> and we have the church militant. That's us. We are the church militant, the church still on earth. But we, all three of these tiers, make up the church, right? So we can't forget about the church triumphant because they've made it to the big dance. They are in heaven. And so all we do, all we do with our saints is we say, will you pray for me? Will you pray for me is all we say. So it's very, very much like asking a dear friend that is on earth to pray for us. If I, if I went to Father Vaughn and say, hey, Father Vaughn, can you pray for me for this certain intention, this certain reason? I have this going on in my life. It's the same as me going to St. Francis and saying, St. Francis, can you please pray for this intention? I need your prayers in this area because I believe prayer is powerful and I believe prayer can move mountains and I believe prayer changes things. So that's what the saints are for us. The difference is the saints are, in, are part of church triumphant. So they are in heaven in constant praise of the father, always wanting to pray for us. So why not ask for their prayers? That is what we do as church. Okay. So, so choosing a patron saying now every every saint has you know is is a patron of of certain things you know saint francis is the patron saint of ecology um saint sebastian is the patron saint of athletes saint cecilia is the patron saint of musicians so every saint you know based upon um based upon their life based upon what kind of life they lived and, and, you know, what their loves and hobbies and interests were and what they did with their life, the church gives them a, a patronage, something, something that, you know, they're closely and intimately uh, connected with. And so that's where I would start. That's the first place I would start is, you know, start researching, okay, who's the patron of artists? because I really love to paint, you know, who, who's the patron of, oh, we just, we just got a new, a new blessed, blessed Carlo Acutis. He is, um, he was a very, very wise in the, the technology and IT department. He was a gamer, you know, so, you know, he's obviously going to be a strong patron in the field of technology, you know, gaming, things like that, because gaming is not bad, just needs to be done in moderation, right? And we need to make sure the games we play, we're playing or are pointing our gaze towards heaven and not the opposite way. Okay, that's what's important with anything that we do, with anything that we do, that's the important thing. And the second, decision we will your your children and and you as a family will want to make is choosing a sponsor now there are there are a couple there are a few um, rules when it comes to choosing a sponsor so just to kind of help you narrow it down you know we would ask that the sponsor you know be 18 years of age and the sponsor needs to be fully initiated into the Catholic Church, which means this sponsor has received the sacraments of baptism, reconciliation, confirmation, and first Holy Communion. So they do not need to be married, okay? But they do need to be fully initiated into the church. And obviously, we want to pray and pray on it and really choose someone that will be a role model and example of the Catholic faith for our kids. 
So obviously it is, it is someone that is practicing their faith, going to mass, you know, frequenting reconciliation, talking about the faith with our children, you know, so, so those are things we want to be thinking of when we make that decision. Uh, you know, think of it along the lines of the godparent. You know, another question I get in regards to the sponsor, can it be a godparent? Absolutely, it can be a godparent. And, and, and that's almost, and I, in my mind, that's a beautiful thing because again, it's another way that we connect for our kids the sacraments of baptism and confirmation because they are so intimately linked. And, you know, so, so the godparent would be an incredible choice. Um, great. So let me stop my share screen here. And then I'm going to stop this recording.